starting in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for the privilege that we have to know you. We're so thankful, Father, for the blessing that you've given us with your word, that we may know from whence we came, how the world became here, why you created it, where we are going, Father, what we can do to please you, what's the problems that we face here upon this earth. We have the knowledge of good and evil, Father, and yet we know that we have been unable to resist it. Mankind has done evil since the beginning. And if it was not, Father, for your mercy and your grace in sending your Son to die for us, we would have no hope. We're thankful to you for sending your Son for the love that you have for your creation for the love that you had for us, Father. We pray that you will give each of us the strength that we need to live our life while we're here upon this earth. We recognize we live in an evil world, Father. We recognize that it is through your word and your strength that we will be able to overcome. We pray, Father, for those of our number who are ill and unable to be here, Father. We pray your blessings upon them. We pray that you will be with the doctors that minister to them, that you will give them the skills, the strength, the wisdom, and the insight they need to do the things that they need to bring them back to health. We pray, Father, that you will walk with us, that you will guard our lives and guard our steps. We pray, Father, when we sin, that you will gently correct us and bring us back to you. We praise you and praise your name and thank you for your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
Presentation number 566. 566. Well In case any of you uh, missed it, uh, Alfred was telling us about some uh, damage in Honduras that we have become aware of because of our brother that we helped to support there, Florentino Maldonado. And this was from, uh, I don't know if it was a tropical depression or a hurricane when it went through Honduras, but its name is Ada. And uh, he let us know that there are brethren there that could use help. So, uh, you know, we help to support Florentino each month but if you would like to make a special uh, donation for brethren there, you can give that to Brother Harold, and he already has a system set up where he sends that each month through Western Union, and he can send this extra assistance so that Florentino can uh, get it to the people that need it. So especially be thinking about our brethren there and all those that are in the path of, of this storm that's, cut, that's uh, going to hit Florida now. Okay, so if you were in the uh, Bible class, you uh, have already been thinking about the purpose of the law, but let's talk about the Old Testament in general. What's the point in studying the Old Testament? I've had people ask me about that. Uh, sometimes when we've been studying uh, in the Old Testament for a while in the Bible class, people will say, oh, we need to get into the New Testament. Well, Let's never underestimate the value of the Old Testament. Now, the, the passage that uh, Brother Bo read for us began in verse 9 of Romans 3. Let's look at the verses that preceded that as that chapter starts, where Paul asks, what advantage has the Jew, or what is the prophet of circumcision, and immediately answers that question by saying, much in every way. Now, we know that salvation has now been extended to the Gentiles, uh, we know that everyone is a candidate for salvation. So what would cause Paul to say that there was something that was a not just a little, but a huge advantage for the Jews prior to that? He says, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. They were advantaged because they had the word of God. And you and I still have that word of God preserved in the Old Testament. And not only there, but even the New Testament writers have preserved Old Testament writings for us right in the middle of their new Holy Spirit-inspired teaching. So I want you to just think about that with me a little bit this morning. You remember in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's start about verse 14, where Paul says to Timothy, You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. Now, what things is he talking about? Verse 15, that from childhood you've known the holy scriptures. Now, what was that? At the time of the writing of the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul would write to a young evangelist, what would he call the holy scriptures that that young man had been exposed to from the time he was a little child? Well, obviously he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets and the Psalms. He says, from childhood you've known the holy scriptures which are able, now listen to this, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now that sounds pretty valuable, doesn't it? The Old Testament is able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then of course in verses 16 and 17, he gives the true value of all Scripture. No matter when it is, has been revealed to man, it is all profitable and it gives us all that we need that we might be uh, thoroughly equipped spiritually. 
So let's think about the value of the Old Testament. The Old Testament reveals the nature of God. Now, somebody brought up this morning, you know, that doesn't change. What God was is what he is, and it's what he ever shall be, because God says, I do not change. So if we read about the nature of God in the Old Testament, that won't change any time in the history of man. Over in Isaiah 40, begin with me uh, in verse 9. Isaiah 40 and verse 9. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and hills in a balance? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. Here you have revealed for you the omnipotence of God. The prophet beautifully demonstrates for us who God is, and especially in comparison to who we are. But also, the mighty power that he possesses simply by virtue of who he is. But the Old Testament also reveals to us much more about who God is. His holiness, his justice, and his wrath. In Leviticus chapter 19, and yes, you will find this in the New Testament as well. Leviticus 19, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord God, am holy. If you're saying, that kind of sounds familiar. Yes, you will read that in this new covenant as well. God's people are to be holy no matter what age and dispensation, uh, dispensation they live in. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, the picture of God. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it seraphim, each one had six wings. With one he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The Old Testament shows us the magnificence, the glory of God, His holiness, and how it is perceived when anyone sees it, even the heavenly beings. Psalm 94 we begin to see a picture of God's justice. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. O God, to whom vengeance belongs. Shine forth, rise up, O judge the earth. Render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? God says, vengeance belongs to me. Justice is going to be rendered. Just read that entire psalm and you have revealed to you 
the justice of God. But you also see the wrath of God. In the book of Nahum, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 5, here you have Nahum's prophecy. Now you remember that Jonah went to Nineveh, and Nineveh did what Jonah didn't want them to do. They repented. They discovered who God was. But now a hundred years later, the prophet Nahum comes along and says, you have forgotten. And now you're going to be judged severely because God is angry with you. And he's going to let the Babylonians come and take over the Assyrians because of the fact that they are not seeing God's holiness, his omnipotence, his justice. And so they will experience his wrath. In verse 5, the mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. Spoken to Nineveh because they had forgotten all of these wonderful attributes of God. And then you've got Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. I want you to look at those verses first. Exodus 34, and verse 6. The Lord passes before Moses. Pass before him and proclaim, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children of the third and fourth generation. Now that's the first time that we read that as it's spoken to Moses, but it will not be the last time. In fact, that passage of Scripture is quoted no less than eight times throughout the Scriptures. Over and over. We read it in Exodus 34, but then we read it again in Numbers 14, verse 18. Then we read it again in Nehemiah 9, and we read it in the Psalms, Psalm 86 and Psalm 103, and we read it in the book of Daniel, Daniel 9, and Joel chapter 2, this, the same passage that Peter refers to on the day of Pentecost, and of special note in Jonah chapter 4. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Does that sound familiar to you? The exact same attributes that God told or was told to Moses as God's presence passed by. So over and over, we have revealed for us who God is, and that never changes. So it doesn't matter if you discover that in a covenant that has been fulfilled, if you discover that in prophets that wrote for a particular purpose to a particular generation. It doesn't matter where you discover it, because God never changes. But also, the Old Testament foretells the Christ. As we talked about in our Bible class this morning in Galatians 4, the purpose of the law was to bring us to Christ. And so you discover the Christ in the Old Testament. Psalm 69 is quoted ten times to refer to Jesus or to the events surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus. Look over there at Psalm 69 with me. And I want to start, uh, these words may look familiar to you. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink deep in mire. Yes, this is a psalm of David, but it seems like every inch of this psalm has a messianic application. Look, look at verse 4. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who hate me without a cause. Does that sound familiar to you? 
Look over at uh, John chapter 15 and verse 25. Back this back up just a little bit. Jesus says in verse uh, 23, He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But look at verse 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So we see that written in Psalm 69, but Jesus refers to that to show exactly what's going on with him uh, during his ministry and up in, in the events that lead up to his crucifixion. Uh, if we go back to uh, Psalm 69 and verse 9, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Almost all of you will recall quickly uh, in John chapter 2 and in verse 17, as Jesus uh, quotes this, or it says in verse 17, his disciples remembered this passage of scripture, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Well, what caused them, what events caused them to remember Psalm 69? Well, uh, if we back up here, it says uh, in verse 13, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And that's what caused the disciples to remember Psalm 69. Psalm 69 told in, in prospect what happened with Jesus in earnest. And it caused his disciples to remember that Old Testament passage. And you can just go right down through Psalm 69 and take each verse and, and see how it is used, so many of them, in this uh, New Covenant. Of course, to me, verse 5 stands out a little bit because if we, if we uh, go back to Psalm 69 and look at verse 5, David says, O oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. There's a lot of passages in Psalm 69 that have a direct reference to Jesus, but this is not one of them. And so Psalm 69 and verse 5 teaches us some levels to these psalms, some different applications to these psalms. We can read this like a Jew. We can read this like a Christian and see uh, the application to ourselves. But the fact that this psalm is used throughout <coughs> Uh, the New Testament shows us the value of the Old Testament. Also, we see as part of the value, it reveals the truth about man. And that's what we need to know, isn't it? Yeah, we need to know about Jesus, but it's like, you know, I, when I sold vacuum cleaners, I got to show people that they got a dirty house and before they're interested in the vacuum cleaner. Are you interested in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross until you understand that you have sin that you can't do anything about? I've got to show you that first. It had to be shown to me, John Mundy. It had to be pointed out to me, John, you're a sinner. Well, what do I do about it? There's nothing you can do about it, but Jesus can do something about it. And so the Old Testament reveals to us this sin problem that we have. And so when we go over to Romans chapter 3 and verses 9 through 20 that uh, Bo read for us, we see man's problem. Now, of course, as we started out uh, in this chapter, uh, we see that the Jew had advantages because the scriptures had been committed to them. But the Jew also had the same disadvantage that the Gentiles do because we're all under sin, he says in verse 9. But notice in verse 10, as it is written. So Paul, in the first century, to teach New Testament holy inspired truths from God is going to jump back 
to the writings of the Old Testament. And so he says in verse 10, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Man, you talk about trying to get the point across. How many times can Paul say it and how many different ways can he say, there's not one. But he's not just saying this as new revelation. He's quoting here. We look over at Psalm 14. Another Psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. So the Apostle Paul uses that to demonstrate these various truths throughout uh, the writing in Romans 3, verses 9 through 20. He quotes six to eight different Old Testament passages, all to prove his point found in verse 9 here. He quotes from Psalm 5. He quotes from Psalm 140. He quotes from Psalm 10, uh, according to the Septuagint version. He quotes from Proverbs 1 and verse 16. And then if we'll go back to verses 18 through 20, <clears throat> Romans chapter 3 and verse 18 through 20. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Again, the Old Testament is used to show how corrupt both Jew and Gentile really are. And a lot of times, you know, we'll, uh, if you're like me, we'll, we'll just go to Romans 3.23 to show somebody everybody sin. But really, when we look at the context of Romans 3 and verse 23, Paul's not trying to show that individuals are guilty of sin, but that a mass group, everybody, is guilty of sin. That we all have the same problem. The Old Testament reveals to us the truth about man. When I say man, I mean mankind. Every man and woman that's ever lived on this earth, the Old Testament demonstrates the problem that we have. The Old Testament warns of the consequences of sin. And really, I mean, that's, that's the problem. That's the truth about man, isn't it? Yes, we're sinners, but what's so big about being a sinner? Well, the consequences of being a sinner. And the Old Testament tells us about that as well. When you look at Hebrews chapter 3 and begin in verse 7, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... Now, you might be expecting after a statement like that some new revelation. But he's not going to give you new revelation right there. He's going to give you old revelation and show how it applies to current revelation that he's giving. As the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. What's he Where's he getting this? Psalm 95 Pardon me. Psalm 95 and beginning in verse 7. Now remember, this was written perhaps a thousand years before Christ. He is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
So the Hebrew writer is showing us there the consequences of sin, God's warning about the consequences of sin, but he's quoting from Psalm 95 to do that. The Old Testament is very valuable. If we look at uh, verses 12 through 19 of uh, Romans 3, beginning in verse 12. They've all turned aside. They together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they practice deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, so on and so forth. The point is that we can be just like those Israelites who fell in the wilderness. And so the Hebrew writer, trying to tell this to modern day people who are striving to be disciples of Jesus, warns them by giving the warning that was given to previous people of God. It, can, it happened to them. It can happen to you. What do they say about learning from history if we don't learn from history? We're doomed to repeat it. And so the Apostle Paul here says, if you don't learn, you can repeat it as well. You can fall into the same problem, and this can be a description of you. And then chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, he says, he talks about a rest. Romans chapter 4, he says, uh, notice as we talks about in verse 3, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Uh, if we continue on down here, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Does that sound familiar to you? Another quote from the Psalms, from David. And then he continues down, talks about circumcision. And uh, in verse 13, the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of of faith. Now, Paul says that uh, we need to learn from this. The Hebrew writer says uh, that we need to learn from this as well. Let's look over at Hebrews chapter 4. And he says, since a promise remains. Now, there was a promise given to the people of God, right? A promised land. But they inherited the promised land. But the Hebrew writer says, there's still a promise. It can't be that land. That land promise has already been fulfilled. So he says a promise remains and we need to fear lest we seem to come short of it. Not the land, but the promise that remains. And he uses these same passages. I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. We just read this in Psalm 95. And uh, again, verse 5, they shall not enter my rest. And again, verse 7, today if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, Psalm 95. Now he says in verse 8, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. So in verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So when you want to warn people now, about the fact that they can fall, go back to people of God who did fall. Now, if there's anybody that believes once you're saved, you're always saved and you can't be lost, then please explain this passage to me because I have obviously missed the point. Why do you bring up an Old Testament example of people who missed the rest and then talk about another rest that you're in danger of missing if you do the same things? What other point is there? If you know, if you're seeing this on Facebook or you're seeing this on YouTube or somewhere and, and you can correct me on this, then please do because I want to know the truth. I think the Old Testament is being used here to warn of the consequences of sin and did so by demonstrating how God's people of old failed miserably and we can too. The Old Testament provides example of faith and obedience. You know, when people ask me, you know, why do we need to study the Old Testament? The first thing that always comes to my mind is I, I always say, well, how would you have a class on Hebrews? How would you teach people about Hebrews? Tell, tell me what your approach would be, and don't use the Old Testament. Man, I, I would like to sit in that class. I would like to see the professor squirm and sweat 
and try to figure out how in the world am I going to talk about this and not refer to the Old Testament. There is no way to do it. The book of Hebrews makes no sense and it cannot be comprehended and you can't get the depth of the meaning that he's talking about unless you go to the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 11 is a shiny example. In Hebrews 11, we're given no less than 19 Old Testament characters to demonstrate faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, the rest of Hebrews 11 is, here's what faith is, and guess where he goes? To the Old Testament. Here's an example. But then when we get to Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, what does he say? Now, seeing that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside this, every, the sin and every weight and, and look where? Look to Jesus. So all those Old Testament examples of faith are supposed to lead us where? To Jesus. It provides examples of faith and obedience that lead us where we need to be. And lastly, the Old Testament teaches the nature of, of salvation, what it means to be saved. Romans chapter 4 and the first eight verses, it, what you will find in those first eight verses is that Paul quotes, first of all, Genesis 15 and verse 6, the promise made to Abraham, and then Psalm 32, a psalm of David. And he uses those two things to, to prove and to demonstrate the points he's trying to get across. Uh, justification by faith means, and the word counted uh, is used over, or reckoned in some of your translations. It's used over and over and over. And it has to do with, it's an accounting term. And so he uses these Old Testament passages and examples to show what he means by being justified by faith as opposed to being justified by works. Down in uh, verses 5 through 8. To him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted, some of your translations may say reckoned, for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from the law. And then what are these next words? In the, the New King James, you'll notice the, the font is different, and they're trying to indicate to you this is an Old Testament quote from Psalm 32. David said, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Folks, this is salvation. So when the Apostle Paul wants to explain what salvation is, where does he go? He goes to the Old Testament example of Abraham, and he uses the words of David uh, in verse 12. And, and, and if we had time, we'd just pick this thing apart verse by verse. But in verse 12, he says, The father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also uh, who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Justification by faith means you're trusting in God to forgive you and God leads you to that forgiveness. Paul uses two Old Testament passages there, Genesis 15 and verse 6 and Psalm 32, to show that they teach justification by faith and you must understand the concepts of those two Old Testament uh, passages to know what it means that your sins have been forgiven. Faith implies really that you've relied on God to do something for you that you cannot do yourself. And so where does he go? To the Old Testament. So I hope that these things will make you appreciate the value of the Old Testament. I know I've had people tell me, you know, I don't really enjoy studying the Old Testament. Well, enjoy it or not, there's much to be learned, and there's some things in the New Testament that you will never fully comprehend until you appreciate where they came from. Uh, 
uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, if, if you are here today and you have not yet obeyed the gospel, uh, we hope that you will see how the Old Testament has led to these New Testament writings uh, about our sin problem, about what salvation really is, about how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the law. It's what all the Psalms were pointing to, what the prophets spoke of, and that you'll come to Jesus, you'll be led to him by those writings, and that you confessing your faith in him would repent and be baptized in his name for the remission of your sins. Everything's ready that you can do that today, and we would encourage you to. And if you are a brother or sister in Christ and you realize that you've not lived your life as one who understands these concepts and appreciates them and shows to the world around you that you understand and appreciate them and you want to start from this day forward and rededicate yourself to being a true disciple of Jesus Christ and we want to pray for you and, and help you to launch into that. If we can help you, let us know right now while we stand and sing. Soul of Savior, thou art living. Soul of Savior.